Hello everyone. In this video, we're going to be solving an interesting partial differential equation, a PDE. We have the partial derivative of u with respect to y plus the partial of u with respect to x equals zero. And we're going to try to find a function u. u is a function of two variables. That's why we have partial derivatives. Partial derivatives means, for example, when you're doing it with respect to y, you treat x as a constant and vice versa. So we're going to try to find a function such that when we take the partial derivatives with respect to two different variables, their sum is always going to be zero. So that's something we're going to explore in a couple different ways. And then at the end, you know, we can also substitute and check our work. So let me go ahead and present two methods. And let's start with the first one. For my first method, I'm going to go ahead and assume that we have a separable solution. How do I know that? Well, these kinds of equations have separable solutions. So I'm gonna go ahead and write u of x comma y, which means u is a function of two variables, can be written as f of x multiplied by g of y, where f of x is a function of x only, and g of y is a function of y only. So f is not gonna contain any y, and g is not going to contain any x. This is important to know because when we differentiate this thing, we're not really going to be doing partial derivatives because we don't have the other variable in the equation. It's only going to be like the normal derivatives. Okay? So let's go ahead and differentiate this with respect to y, which means x is going to be treated as a constant. So when you differentiate with respect to y, since f is a constant, we can safely say that this f of x is going to stay, and we're just going to differentiate g, which is a function of y, so we're going to write it as g prime. Similarly, when you differentiate u with respect to x, g of y is going to be a constant, so it's just going to stay, and f will be differentiated, giving us f prime. So those are the partial derivatives in terms of f and g, so now we're going to go ahead and add them, because their sum is supposed to be zero, right? That's what the original equation says. So if we add f of x g prime of y plus g of y times f prime of x equals zero. Now, what do you make of this? We have two functions, f and g, and we have this jumbo mambo, right? So we kind of need to separate the variables to get a better understanding. So to kind of clear the waters. So let's go ahead and do this. Since I already have the derivative of g here, I want to put this in a derivative of the function divided by the function itself form. So let's go ahead and subtract this from both sides first. So we can write this as f of, of x multiplied by g prime of y oops, equals negative g of y multiplied by f prime. Great. Now, we're going to separate the variables. So we're going to go ahead and bring this y over to the left-hand side, and we're going to put the x on the right-hand side. So divide and divide. You're going to get g prime of y divided by gy equals I'm going to leave the minus sign here on the right-hand side. Either way is fine, but I'd like to leave it on the right-hand side. Minus f prime divided by f. Now, when you look at an equation like this, this should mean a lot to you. First of all, we have a function and its derivative, the derivative of the function divided by the function itself. What does that remind you? It is the derivative of the ln of that function, right? What is the derivative of ln of a function h? Let's just use another variable, right? It will be h prime divided by h. That's exactly what we have, except on the right-hand side, we have a minus sign, which is okay, because minus sign is just like a constant being multiplied by the function. So it doesn't really matter, no big deal. But here's the most important part to understand if you're dealing with functions or equations like this that have separable solutions. Once you separate the variables, you kind of need to think about it. g prime of y divided by g of y is kind of like a ratio of two functions of y. So it's kind of like a rational function of y. And the other side, the right-hand side, is a function of x. You see that? So how can a function of y equal a function of x? 
a function of y only which doesn't contain x. So this function doesn't contain x, this function doesn't contain y. How can something that contain x and y? It needs to be a constant, exactly. So whenever you have the scenario where function of y equals a function of x, always set them equal to a constant, and then everything unfolds from here. And this is where the fun begins. Now, you may do this in a couple of different ways. You can kind of, you know, write this as g prime is c times g and kind of bring it down and then set it equal to zero. And then you, you can replace g with something like e to the power of mx or something like that. But there is no need to do that because if you think about it, this is actually the derivative of ln of gy. So it's like ln of gy, the derivative of that equals negative ln of f of x, of course, the derivative of that, right? That's what this means, isn't it? So, but what is that supposed to mean? We have the ln, the derivative of the ln. So we can kind of put these lns together, ln of gy. And by the way, if you want to use absolute value, I mean, you're absolutely right about it, which I'm not going to use here, but you can if you want, no big deal. I'm just going to keep it simple and assume that f and g are positive. They don't have to be, by the way, but anyways, so we can write an equation like this now, which is really cool because if you have the sum of two derivatives, it just means the derivative of the sum. So we can kind of write it like this, right? And... This is huge because if the derivative of something is zero, right? Think about it. Then that thing needs to be a constant. Not only the ratios is a constant, but now we get another equation which gives us that ln of gy plus ln of f of x is equal to a constant k. Awesome. Now, what does this mean? Well, there's a couple of ways to look at it. We can first go ahead and combine these two things, write this as uh, g of y times f of x. So the sum of the two logs can be written like that. And then uh, the product f of x times g of y, I want to write the x first, is e to the power k because, and I could probably just call this maybe k sub 1 so that I can use k at the end because e to the power k sub 1 is just another constant and I can write it as k. So what's that supposed to mean? So now we have two functions such that their product is equal to a constant. So what do you make of this, right? So from here, we kind of need to find the solution. So we could probably say something like, okay, g can be written as k divided by f of x. But remember, we assumed that our u is written as f of x times g of y. Now we find that f of x times g of y is a constant. What's that supposed to mean? So that means u is a constant, right? Exactly, because that's what u is, or u r, u is. So we were looking for a solution, and now k, a constant, happens to be a solution. Is that the only solution? Though no, obviously this works because the derivative of constant with respect to whatever variable is always zero, and zero plus zero is equal to zero. But isn't there a better solution than this? So let's get back to this. And actually, I'm going to write it uh, in the uh, original form. So I'm going to go ahead and take this. And can I approach this problem a little differently? So let's go ahead and look at it from another angle, right? There's a minus sign. Let's not forget that. And like I said earlier, these two are equal a constant. Now let's go ahead and look at this separately. G prime is CG. And then G prime minus CG is equal to zero. And at this point, I can go ahead and assume that since g is a function of y, g can be written as e to the power my, where m is just another constant, right? And when you plug it in, you're going to get m e to the my minus c m e to the my equals zero. And when you factor out e to the my times m, you're going to get 1 minus c equals zero. From here, you're going to get c equals 1. Now, what does that say? What does that mean? That means that our constant c is 1, but we're not looking for c, actually, are we? We kind of want to solve for m. So in this case, if we're looking for an m value, m needs to be 0, because that's what makes this 0, right? But if you take c equals 1, then you can safely say that, okay, g equals e to the power my works, where c is equal to 1, so it's just going to be like g prime is equal to g. 
but that's satisfied when uh, we have g as k times e to the power y. This satisfies this equation, right? So we, we kind of have like a function of exponential function, in other words, right? And, and similarly, you're going to find for f something like a negative constant times e to the x. But when you put those two together, you're going to get something like this. U should be a times a big like main constant, e to the power x times e to the power y. And of course, this, should, this could be written as e to the power x plus y. But the million dollar question is, is that going to satisfy our equation? Let's go ahead and find out. When you do the derivatives like this, the derivative with respect to y is just going to be a, a times e to the x plus y. And when you add the other one, this is not going to be 0 unless a is equal to 0. So it looks like a constant will work better in this case, right? So k is a constant and u must be a constant. Right? Okay. Let's go ahead and take a look at it from another angle, which I think uses, what is it called? The characteristic method. Now, here's the thing. The second method, I'll explain the process in a very non-rigorous way, in layman terms. Sorry if you are a rigor police. And if, you know, if I'm mistaken, correct me. Uh, of course, I'll probably make some mistakes because it's something that I'm kind of looking into and I'm not exactly sure, but my understanding tells me that this can be solved with the characteristic method. Let me go ahead and present it and you get to decide, okay? So we have the following equation and then we can kind of go back to method one and discuss why we got something different, if we get something different. All right, so here's how it works. We kind of look at the coefficient of uh, u with respect to y, the partial derivatives, and the coefficient of this one. And we notice that the coefficients are one, okay? So because the coefficients are one, we're gonna go ahead and do the following. We're gonna go ahead and divide. So if the coefficients were p and q, we would write it like this, dy over p equals dx over q. So p and q are kind of like polynomials, maybe a function of y here and function of x, or it could be a function of both. But on the right-hand side, notice that we have a zero. So that means that we're not really going to have a du, or even if we do, it's going to look like this. But in some context, like, doesn't this look like something is undefined here? So I don't know. Sometimes they use this type of notation. I don't really know what it means exactly. But I think it just means that we're not going to consider u in this case. And of course, we're going to consider a constant scenario. Again, this is going to be super non-rigorous. Sorry if you're really concerned about rigor. You're not going to find it. All right, so anyways, so in this case, P and Q happen to be 1, so I have something like this, dy over 1 equals dx over 1. And from here, we basically get dy over dx, which means y is equal to x plus a constant c. Cool. Now, how does that work, though? Well, here's the thing. We kind of need to isolate the constant here and write this as c equals y minus x. So remember, we, we didn't have a u on the right-hand side. It's homogeneous. So this brings in another constant, which I'm going to call c sub 1. And c sub 1 is actually a constant of the other... I'm sorry. c sub 1 is a function of the other constant. So this is not a constant, but we call it a constant. And in this case, c sub 1 happens to be a function of y minus x, which basically actually gives us our u. Does that make sense? Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at this. It's kind of wild, right? So u of uh, x, x comma y it needs to be a function of y minus x. What is that supposed to mean? Think about it. What is the function of y minus x? Well, here's one. y minus x is a function of y minus x, right? It's just the same function, identity. So can u be y minus x? Let's test it out. What's the derivative of u with respect to y? 1. What is the derivative of u with respect to x? Negative 1, because the coefficient of x is negative 1. What is their sum? 0. It satisfies our equation. Take another one. Can u be y minus x squared? Test it out. Can u be sine of y minus x? Again, test it out and you'll hopefully find a solution. Now, let's go ahead and take a look at the result from Wolfram Alpha. That's where we're gonna finish. If this was a long video, too bad. 
I'm not sorry about it because I wanted to cover a lot in one video. But, uh-oh, Wolfram Alpha does not understand your query. Not smart enough or smarter than LLMs. Whatever you call them. Anyways, this brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Please let me know. Don't forget to comment, like, and subscribe. I'll see you next time with another video. Until then, be safe, take care, and bye-bye.